Hello, my name is Dr. Dustin Grooms. I'm a professor in the Division of Physical Therapy at Ohio University, where I direct a research laboratory. This is going to be part one of our two-part series in the Journal of Athletic Training, titled Sensory Motor Neural Correlates of Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury Risk Biomechanics. When we typically think about how you generate movement, you commonly may think of the sensory cortex or the motor cortex, but we now know today is that when you go to generate any movement, you actually encode information from your entire brain you're seeing, experiencing, feeling, what you're tending to. There's a whole lot of neurological factors that go into motor control beyond just the motor cortex, spinal cord, and the muscles. This is really apparent when we look at these non-contact injury events, whereby a player goes to change direction, and his obviously his attention is not directed at controlling his joints, it's directed into the environment. And the thing about where they need to go, what other players are doing. There's a whole host of neurocognitive load that's occurring in this moment that commonly goes unattended to which led us to one of our research questions. What is the, the neural correlates related to injury risk motor behavior? So what we did was we recruited 30 female high school athletes and we found about half were classified as high risk based on knee abduction moment or that loading of the knee towards the midline or overly valgus alignment. About half were considered very low risk, had very good neutral knee alignment. And then we had them come into our MRI and we did a series of neuroimaging experiments. We did knee position control tasks and got their brain activity to do this. Then we got in more knee force control or a more leg press multi-joint movement tasks and we get their neural activity to execute that. This allows us to get a better idea for how you're controlling your knee from various aspects, not just isolated to the quads, but more integrated systems control. And what we found was that those that landed with low injury risk, their brain activates in blue. This is a very expected sensory motor activation pattern to execute these kinds of movements. However, if you land with high risk, you activate the same sensory motor network that you would expect, but you also bring these areas in red online. This area in red is an area in your occipital cortex that bridges between your parietal cortex. It's called your lingual gyrus, but also includes elements of your precuneus, inferior parietal cortex, and angular gyrus. What these regions do they're called cross-modal regions. You're basically trying to integrate where am I am in space visually with where am I in space proprioceptively. And that's what these regions are trying to figure out. And so for whatever reason, those that move with high injury risk, they're bringing online these extra sensory integration regions due to the exact same motor task. We also see increased activation in the motor cortex and some areas in the frontal cortex. While these areas also turned on for the ACLs, that's why they're also in blue and you have just a little bit of red shading, are those that land with high risk, they have higher levels of activity of those regions. So they bring on online new regions and they have higher activity of some of the regions our low risk um, athletes are also using. What we theorize this to mean is that our high risk athletes, those that just from dropping out from a box landing with high risk, not to mention all that neurocognitive load of sport, they have this initial degrade of their ability to maintain that implicit joint stability. So what we think is happening this neural activity associated with generating movement, potential processing, and that proprioceptive visual integration, they're starting to rely on it a lot more. And we think this leads to them having a degrade or a loss of ability to control their knee in space when they're challenged visual spatially. So as you're seeing this athlete, her attention is in the environment, her attention is on the ball, on anywhere but controlling her knee. So she's using the resources that our high-risk patients are using just to move their leg to engage in the world as you're supposed to. We think that can lead to a saturation of their motor coordination ability and lead to this neuromuscular breakdown. You essentially you can't have two neurons connected to different places and do the same thing. And so the neurons that are being dedicated to just controlling your knee and the high-risk patient makes them susceptible to these coordination errors when suddenly those neurons are asked to engage in the world. Some ways you can deal with this is an, as an athletic trainer, physical therapist, trying to treat these patients. We've done some preliminary studies looking at stroboscopic training where you essentially interrupt their visual processing, we found this can improve neural efficiency of frontal and sensory integration regions. So this essentially does the reverse. It can help decrease activity of those regions, make them more efficient, better able to handle the load of controlling the joint and interacting in the world. You can also change how you prescribe your exercises. You can think about how you tell your patients to move. Try to put their attention in the world as much as you can. These examples are called external focus. They can be very powerful. They can help direct your patient's attention away from controlling their joint and encouraging them to use that implicit motor control strategy that you're meant to use. This work wouldn't be possible without my exceptional co-authors between Ohio University, Santa Children's Hospital, and now Emory the Spark Performance Center. Um, it's truly a collaborative effort in the NIH for funding the work. And of course, my spectacular lab at Ohio University, uh, they make coming to work every day wonderful, and we're very lucky to work with such great colleagues. Thank you very much.